Now for line number three, grazing can reverse climate change. Savory claims that people who understand far more about carbon than I do say that by using holistic management on half of the world's grasslands, we can bring CO2 down to pre-industrial levels. Who are these people and in what journals has this been published in? As this Guardian article realized after trying to interview Savory about this exact question, these are not published data. But in reality, Savory's methods cannot reverse global warming because the theoretical maximum of carbon sequestration using all of the rangeland in the world is, quote, eightfold less than Mr. Savory's claims would require. That we can only sequester one-eighth as much carbon as we would continue to spew. And it is also worth noting that carbon sequestration in grasslands diminishes over time. Quote, the capacities of soil to sequester carbon do not increase indefinitely, they encounter upper limits. So yeah, even if Alan Savory's techniques do work and we reach Alan Savory's fantasy of grazing the entire world with his technique, we would still not be able to keep up with emissions. And given that animal agriculture is currently responsible for one-sixth to one-half of all emissions, we could just stop that. But what about methane? Savory never seems to mention that grass-fed cows actually produce more methane than grain-fed cows. And looking at this study, which is often used to support the soil sequestration of Savory's method, it becomes clear that methane emissions far outweigh the benefits. To be generous, this graph shows a two tons of CO2 per hectare sequestration over five years, or 0.4 tons per hectare per year. Yet a single grass-fed cow can release 250 pounds of methane, which is 25 times more effective than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. A hectare is often mentioned as enough land to support a grass-fed cow, so that's three tons of CO2 equivalent emitted per hectare per year. That is seven to eight times worse than the sequestration that they are claiming. So this graph would be a more accurate representation. Now for line number four, plants die without grazing. Plants do not require grazed animals to succeed. Just look at New Zealand. Before it was colonized, it was lush, yet despite having no large grazing animals, and in fact, no mammals other than bats and marine mammals at all. But isn't New Zealand just one of those places that Alan Savory says is too humid to desertify? No, there's actually a section of New Zealand called the Rangapo Desert, and by Savory's logic, would have spread because there were no grazing animals. As for the US, large sections of it, like the Great Basin and the Southwest, were not historically heavily grazed, as he would like us to believe. Well, if it isn't a lack of animals, then how are things desertifying? Savory claims that scientists do not know why these places are desertifying. Well, he fails to mention changing rain patterns. As the atmosphere warms up, there are certain places in the world that are getting more intense but shorter rainfall, which is not conducive to plant life. So it's not just from taking animals off the landscape. All right, lie number five, it is economically viable. Much of Savory's narrative hinges on the methods being profitable and therefore people propagating it throughout the entire world. But is that the case? Back to this review of the Charter Grazing Trial, quote, Supplemental feed costs were higher for the two savory grazing systems, noting that the cattle became stressed and fatigued and lost enough weight to compromise their profitability. And there's this review from 2000 mentioned earlier, which also found that savory's technique, quote, has no financial advantage. And holistic management involves frequently rotating cattle, which often involves electric fences. And again, from Gerard Wedderburn Bishop of the World Preservation Foundation, quote, temporary or permanent fencing is labor intensive. Moving herds daily requires far more labor input than most operations can afford. Again, there is just no real evidence for how holistic management is profitable. But what about Polyface Farms? Their success is worth like 10 peer-reviewed studies, right? Since they're making money using Savory's techniques, aren't they just proof that you can reverse desertification and climate change? No, well, first of all, they're in Virginia, they're not in a desert, and second of all, as this New York Times op-ed shows, it's all quite nice, quote, until we learn that he feeds his chickens with tens of thousands of pounds a year of imported corn and soy feed. He then uses those chickens to fertilize his cattle pastures, which sounds like a little bit more than bunched and moving livestock to me. Not to mention, he sells his meat for a premium because it's organic, free range, everything great and costly. So this is not economically viable in the real world. All right, moving on, what are the results of Alan Savory's TED Talk? 
By logic, you would think that people would hold off on all meat altogether until this system was holistically managed. But nope, there's a big switch in their head that goes from meat is destroying the planet to meat can save the planet, and they go out and buy a burger and continue to support this highly environmentally destructive system. In the end, Alan Savory has one great gift, and that is convincing himself and a bunch of people that killing a ton of animals is the solution. And he is so regretful about the 40,000 elephants that he convinced people to destroy based on a false theory. Loving elephants as I do, that was the saddest and greatest blunder of my life, and I will carry that to my grave. Yet he is repeating this pattern. All of the solutions involve killing animals. If you were on a sinking ship with Alan Savory, and people were shouting, what should we do? He'd be like, let's take all of the animals on board, kill them, and strap them together to create a raft. And meanwhile, there are lifeboats sitting right there. He is promoting the ongoing exploitation and killing of animals as the solution when it is not. It's essentially that Savory's techniques are something that people emotionally want to be true, but it just does not hold water scientifically, and as you've seen, there are so many reasons that it is not the way to go, and it is just encouraging a highly destructive system known as animal agriculture. Now for a bonus section on solutions. Here are a few solutions that are very promising. Number one, Jeff Lawton's Greening the Desert. In this unfortunately low resolution mini documentary, which I'll link below, Jeff Lawton explains how they took actual desert in Jordan that gets virtually no rainfall and had salted soil, applied permaculture techniques such as swales to trap water, and produced figs within four months. Who would think that you could put an oasis up in this, what looks like an incredibly barren landscape? Just the right combinations, just the right combinations of, of access to water, water recharge, water harvest, and a mixture of species. Number two, the forest man of India. He created a forest from a barren wasteland that is larger than Central Park in New York City by hand. Instead of controlling and killing animals, he protects the elephants, rhinos, deer, and other animals that his forest attracts from poachers. Number three, hemp farming. Most people don't know that hemp is actually a desert plant, and Alan Savory would like you to believe that a large portion of the world can only be used for animals with things like 95% of that land can only feed people from animals. I remind you that I am talking about most of the world's land. Wrong, hemp originated environments that get less than 10 inches of rainfall per year and can produce with anywhere over 12 inches of rainfall. You can grow it for food, textiles, plastics, fuel, building materials, and the list goes on, which present massive economic opportunity. Number four, actual wild grazing by creating wildlife corridors. If you really want animals to graze, you can reintroduce the buffalo and wolves to not arrogantly mimic nature, but let nature do its thing. That way, the ecosystem gets the full benefit of carbon sequestration by the animal, and it doesn't just steal it away after a year or so when you kill it. All right, now number five, symbiotic soil fungi. 16% of the world's carbon is already stored in soil fungi, and it can hold together as much as 70% of carbon in forests like those of Sweden. And guess what? We can inoculate systems because 95% of plants are compatible with symbiotic fungi. Number six, veganism. It is undoubtedly the best way to eat for the planet. And here is my big vegan solution, which is absolutely not gonna be on a TED Talk anytime soon. Step one, eliminate all animal agriculture and instantly recover 45% of the Earth's land. You can then use the grain that wasn't fed to animals and feed 800 out of 900 million hungry people just with US grain alone. This will also stop the vast majority of deforestation, extinction, and of course, greenhouse gas emissions. Step two, use that freed up land to plant forests like Forest Man, restore wildlife corridors and natural habitat, do veganic agriculture and vegetable farming, which this World Bank report says stores more carbon than any other method. And in places like the US where 56% of our fresh water is used for animal agriculture, you can just take a fraction of that and green the deserts from the edges in. All of this effectively sequestering a massive amount of CO2. But since I can't take totalitarian control over the world, you can start by eating vegan, which looks like this. So don't believe the hype. That's it for today, and thank you for watching. Alan! Alan! Al! Alan!
Ja, dat is een alien.